If you're listening to this podcast on YouTube, for a better experience, switch to the video version. The link is in the top right corner of the video and in the episode description. Hello and welcome, I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today we're going to go through the interpretation of abnormal liver function tests, or LFTs, including initial follow-up management, always focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. And for that, I will summarize the British Society of Gastroenterology guidelines on NFTs. They were first published in the BMJ, and the relevant links are in the episode description. Although the food guideline covers both adults and children, in today's episode I will be focusing only on adults. And at the end, I will also tell you how to access my summary of the recommendations, which will be based not only on the British Society of Gastroenterology, but also on a number of NHS bodies in the UK. The links to them are in the episode description, and it's worth having a look, as they have flowcharts charts and other information that you may find useful. Right, there's a lot of information to cover, so let's jump into it. The three most common causes of liver disease are alcohol-related liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and viral hepatitis, although autoimmune liver disease is also significant. Liver disease develops silently and at earlier stages, liver enzymes may be normal. If they are high, the degree of abnormality is not necessarily related to the severity of the underlying condition, and this is why many patients are not diagnosed until they have developed significant liver fibrosis. In many cases, if used in isolation, NFTs are neither very specific or sensitive, and they are better at assessing liver fibrosis if incorporated into algorithms or ratios. What constitutes LFTs? Well, the NFT standard panel can vary from hospital to hospital. Although we call them LFTs, not all the tests assess liver function. For example, high liver enzymes point towards liver injury. Bilirubin, albumin and INR give information on liver function, while platelets can give information on the level of liver fibrosis. So let's have a look at a number of these tests. Bilirubin is the byproduct of the breakdown of hemoglobin. It exists in two forms, unconjugated and conjugated. Bilirubin is transported to the liver as unconjugated bilirubin, where it is converted into conjugated bilirubin. A high unconjugated level is usually due to hemolysis or impaired conjugation, whereas a high conjugated level is typically due to liver disease or biliary obstruction. Many path labs will routinely report just total bilirubin, but they will give a breakdown if the level is abnormal or if specifically requested. In normal circumstances, the majority of bilirubin should be conjugated. So if the majority of the bilirubin is unconjugated, then in the absence of hemolysis, the cause is almost always Gilbert syndrome, where the enzyme that conjugates bilirubin has a reduced activity with a consequent rise in unconjugated bilirubin. It is not associated with liver disease or ill health, so patients should be fully reassured. Albumin is a protein that is produced only in the liver, and because of this, it is often considered as a marker of liver function. However, albumin can also be reduced in, for example, sepsis, inflammatory disorders, and malabsorption. Prothrombin or PT, and INR, can also be used to measure liver function as the underlying clotting factors are made in the liver. Therefore, a high prothrombin and INR can indicate liver dysfunction, but it can only be caused by vitamin K deficiency as seen in fat malabsorption and chronic cholestasis. A reduction in platelets or thrombocytopenia is an indicator of advanced liver disease. A low platelet count is caused by a decreased production due to bone marrow suppression splenic sequestration due to portal hypertension, and increased platelet destruction due to sheer stress and fibrinolysis in liver cirrhosis or due to antiplatelet antibodies in non-immune liver disease. Alkaline phosphatase, or ALP, is produced mainly in the liver, but is also found in bone, intestines, kidneys and placenta. Levels are physiologically higher in childhood because of bone growth, and in pregnancy due to placental production. High levels can be due to bone disease, for example bone metastases and fractures, and cholestatic liver disease, like for example in binary obstruction. 
gamma glutamyl transferase or gamma GT is present in the liver but not in bone. And therefore, when ALP is high, the measurement of gamma GT can indicate whether the alkaline sulfatase is of hepatic or non hepatic origin. The most likely cause of non hepatic high alkaline sulfatase in someone asymptomatic is vitamin D deficiency. A high gamma GT can also be due to obesity, excess alcohol, or drugs. AST and ALT are enzymes present in the liver cells, and the levels increase in response to cell injury or death. ALT is considered more liver specific, while AST is also present in skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle tissue, and so it may be elevating patients with MI or myositis. An AST ALT ratio of greater than 1. It's a non-invasive marker of advanced fibrosis. Although AST and ALT can be normal even in liver disease, the high AST-ALT ratio generally persists even if both values are normal. When should LFTs be checked? We should do so when there are non-specific symptoms such as fatigue, nausea or anorexia, symptoms or signs of advanced liver disease like ascites, peripheral edema, spider navy or hepatosplenomegaly. In these cases, checking the INR would also help assess the synthetic function. Conditions which are associated with liver disease like autoimmune diseases and inflammatory bowel disease. Hepatotoxic drugs like for example camomazepine, macrolide antibiotics, statins, tabinafine and methotrexate. And all those statins can lead to drug-induced liver injury. This is very rare and they are generally safe in patients with raised liver transaminase levels if they are less than three times the upper limit of normal. Family history of liver diseases such as hemochromatosis or Wilson's disease, suspected alcohol-related liver disease and suspected one of hepatitis. So what should we do when confronted by abnormal LFTs? We often think that the extent of abnormality of the LFTs correlates with the severity of the problem. However, this assumption is not supported by the evidence. Common conditions leading to chronic liver disease like NAFLD and hepatitis C are frequently associated with only mild to moderate LFT abnormalities. There is also the assumption that the duration of the abnormal LFTs is a reflection of clinical significance. So we often keep repeating the LFTs, hoping that they will improve. And although LFTs can occasionally be high due to intercurrent illness, Studies have shown that the vast majority still have abnormal NFTs after two years, and therefore a strategy of simply repeating them can really be justified. Besides, in many chronic liver diseases such as hepatitis C and NAFLD, the NFTs returning to normal do not necessarily imply the resolution of the disease. This has led to the British Society of Gastrology to recommend that patients with abnormal NFTs should have a full liver screen irrespective of the level and duration of the abnormality. And before moving on, let's remember that there are three common patterns of abnormal NFTs. One, an isolated raised bilirubin with otherwise normal liver tests. Two, a cholestatic pattern, normally showing a high alkaline phosphatase and gamma GT. And three, a hepatitic pattern, with a raised ALT and AST, indicating hepatocellular injury, like for example viral hepatitis, NAFLD, and alcohol-related liver disease. The British Society of Gastroenterology has produced a flowchart to guide us through the process. You can access it in the episode description. But in summary, if there are signs of things that take liver failure, like unexplained clinical jaundice, a low albumin, or a high INR, or if there is suspicion of malignancy, for example because of weight loss or marked cholestasis, we should urgently refer or admit the patient. If there is isolated raised bilirubin but no clinical concerns, then we should request a full blood count and repeat the LFTs on a fasting sample, requesting the breakdown of conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin. Fasting causes the unconjugated bilirubin to rise further in Gilbert syndrome. So this is the likely diagnosis when this happens and there is no evidence of hemolysis, like anemia. If there is associated anemia, we will have to consider hemolysis 
and we will request a reticulocyte count and LDH. If the pattern is cholestatic or hepatitic, we will do a liver screen. This should include an ultrasound, hepatitis B and C screening, an autoantibody screen, serum immunoglobulin, both ferritin and transferrin saturation, and often a celiac screen, alpha-1 antitrypsin levels, and ceruloplasmin. If a patient has a cholestatic picture and the liver screen shows abnormalities, will the ALP and gamma GT remain high even in the context of normal investigations? We will refer the patient to secondary care. If the patient has a hepatitic picture with a high ALT and ASD, studies have shown that the majority will have NAFLD or alcohol related liver disease, and most will not need referral. But lifestyle advice and monitoring primary care. The deciding factor is the level of liver fibrosis, which we can estimate using non invasive fibrosis markers. The British Society of Gastroenterology has also produced a specific flowchart for when NAFLD is suspected following a liver ultrasound scan. You can also access it in the episode description. In summary, it says that for patients with NAFLD or liver disease of unknown cause, the next step is to estimate the risk of fibrosis using the FIP4 or NAFLD fibrosis score, values of 1.3 or less and of minus 1.455 or less respectively, represent a low risk of advanced fibrosis. Higher cutoff points of 2 or below or 0.12 or below respectively should be used for patients over 65. In these cases, we will just manage the risk factors in primary care and reassess periodically, generally every 2 to 5 years. FIB4 or NAFL fibrosis score values greater than 1.3 and minus 1.455 respectively should have second-line tests such as an enhanced liver fibrosis blood test, also known as an ELF test, or imaging such as a fibroscan or elastography. However, patients with a very high FIB4 score greater than 3.25 or a NAFLD fibrosis score of greater than 0.675 should be referred without waiting to do an ELF test, fibroscan or elastography. Those with intermediate FIP4 scores, that is between 1.3 and 3.25, or NAFL fibrosis score, that is between minus 0.455 and 0.625, should have an ELF test or a fibroscan. If the result is 9.5 or less or 7.8 or less respectively, we will manage them in primary care and we will refer if the results are above those limits. In primary care, the treatment for NAFLD is weight loss, alcohol advice, the reduction of cardiovascular risk, and the management of comorbidities. Next, the British Society of Gastroenterology has also produced a specific flowchart to guide us if alcohol-related liver disease is suspected. I have also put a link to it in the episode description. And in summary, those drinking 35 units a week or more if you're a woman and 50 units or more if you're a man, we need referral to both alcohol services and hepatology for further assessment with a fibroscan or elastography. For all other patients, the Audit C questionnaire alongside brief intervention is recommended initially. If the Audit C is 5 or more, we will need to give them the full Audit questionnaire. For patients with an OD score of more than 19, we will also need to refer them to both alcohol services and hepatology for further assessment. For those with an OD score of between 8 and 19, we should change the gamma GT. And if it is over 100, we should refer them as for the higher risk group. Otherwise, we could monitor them and refer to alcohol services if excessive drinking persists. The treatment of alcohol Related liver disease is to stop drinking harmfully, and for many this usually means complete abstinence. Weight loss sometimes also helps because there is a synergy between alcohol and obesity. For example, when the BMI is greater than 35, the risk of liver disease doubles for any given alcohol intake. But finally, what do we do if the patient has a hepatitic pattern with a high ALT and ASD without an obvious cause? that is when the liver screen is normal and there is no evidence of NAFLD on ultrasound or excess alcohol? 
In those cases, we will need to re-examine the history to exclude potential drug-induced causes. Also, ultrasound is only sensitive for steatosis when hepatocytes are more than 30% steatotech, so patients with milder steatosis might have a normal ultrasound. So if these patients are obese or have metabolic risk factors, and we suspect that they may still have NAFLD, despite the normal ultrasound, we should assess them in accordance with the NAFLD flowchart. As I mentioned earlier, we should follow it for patients with NAFLD and liver disease of unknown cause. Well, this is the end of the British Society of Gastroenterology guideline itself. I have created a quick reference guide, which contains the various British Society of Gastroenterology flowcharts, as well as information found in NHS pathways from South East London, North and East Devon, North Bristol and West Hampshire. Links to their information and flowcharts are in the episode description. They all had similar advice to the British Society of Gastroenterology guideline, but there were also some other elements which would be useful from a practical perspective. Where there was a discrepancy between their guidance, I have generally opted for the most conservative approach. If you have any doubt, please consult the original guidance or seek local specialist advice. You will be able to find a link to the note my summary in the episode description. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for listening and goodbye.